Hi, I collected survey data on 525 people. The good news is that there are some people who are recovering from chronic illness. There's hope if you have unexplained illness such as long COVID or ME-CFS. In this video, we're going to take a look at the data on recovery. And after that, we'll look at how 36 people recovered and what treatments helped them on their road to recovery. I'll start by talking about this nerd in the mirror, myself. My chronic illness started in June 2021. Suddenly, I was extremely tired and couldn't walk for more than five minutes without crashing. My mind didn't work properly, so I lost my ability to do computer programming as I couldn't focus. Uh, br brain fog, basically. I also had tremors in my fingers whenever I tried to move them, uh, which you can see in the video on screen. Fortunately for me, I was able to mostly recover. My fingers work normally now. For some time, I experienced survivor's guilt because I got my life back and so many other people haven't. Anyways, I want to see more people not have to deal with chronic illness. It's not fun being sick and abandoned by the medical system. One of the things that struck me is that patients as a group are doing a huge amount of medical experimentation on themselves. But there hasn't been much of an effort put into collecting that data and figuring out how people have recovered. A few other patients have done survey work on treatment outcomes, but so far nobody has gone as far as serving 235 treatments to build a comprehensive picture. So instead of having a social life, I spent hundreds of hours doing data gathering and analysis. Who needs parties when you have Jupiter Lab and hierarchical clustering? So what you're looking at here is de-identified data from the survey. I may have gone a little overboard with the uh, data analysis. If you print, this, print out this web page, it's a little over 200 pages. So I'll try to summarize important parts so that I don't overwhelm you with a fire hose of data. Let's start by talking about the uh, people who have recovered. An obvious issue is that people have different definitions of what recovery is. So on social media, they'll say things like they're 100% recovered, even though they still have significant health problems and maybe can't even work. The survey uses a stricter definition to weed out like potentially misleading data. So the survey asks patients three questions about severity in the past month. This means that the recovered have to be able to walk reasonably well, like more than five minutes. They have to be able to work the old job without accommodations, and they can only have minimal complaints about their symptoms. These people are actually mostly recovered um, since they could still have like some minor symptoms. But I went with this somewhat looser definition so that the sample sizes are larger. The people aren't fully recovered in the strictest sense, but you know, like most chronic illness sufferers would be ecstatic to get to the point of being mostly recovered and basically getting their life back. So in this heat map you see on screen, there's a comparison between somebody's worst month and their past 30 days. This is the simplest way of looking at how much people have improved since their worst flare. The people in this top row have had it the worst since their worst month was as bad as it can possibly get, according to the severity scale anyways. And then from there, the people in the lower rows didn't have as, as bad. In general, there's a strong correlation between the peak severity and somebody's current severity. If somebody's illness is mild, then they're far, far more likely to be doing well now. If somebody had it really bad, then they'll still probably have it bad. So if you start off at this top row here, your chances of recovery are really low. And if you start off on one of these lower rows, then your chances are, of recovery are much better. So it turns out in the survey, 8% became mostly recovered. So how did these people recover? Uh, the survey gathered data in two ways. The first method was to look at the treatments that the recovered rated as leading to significant improvement. The issue is that one person said that a whopping 23 treatments led to significant improvement, while another person said that 22 treatments led to significant improvement. So to narrow things down, the second method asked the question, what was the one treatment or combination of treatments that helped you the most? So asking that question leads to a much more focused list of treatments. Here are the results from the second method. It's a hodgepodge of, hodgepodge of answers for long COVID patients. And here's the rest of it. If you want to look at all of this data in detail, the slides for this video are available in the video description below. So don't, don't freak out if you miss anything. Uh, you can always come back to the slides when you're done watching. So here's a quick overview of the treatments that were mentioned at least twice in the freeform answers. Fasting. So fasting in its various forms was mentioned the most at six times. Both dry and wet fasting were mentioned. Dry fasting is when you don't, you don't drink any water while fasting. It was mentioned once. It's unclear if dry fasting has any additional benefit over wet fasting, so maybe you don't need to go you know, so crazy to the point of not drinking any water. And as far as duration goes, people reported success with different durations. 
there's probably an edge to the longer fast. Later on in this video, I'll tell you how to get more information on the various, various treatments discussed in this video. And then in this next one, the active ingredient in cilantro was mentioned three times uh, because YouTube just doesn't like people talking about this forbidden molecule. I provide information about the Centaur deworming drug on other platforms. Links are in the video description below. NAC or N-acetylcysteine was mentioned three times. 217 people tried this treatment, so only about 0.9% of the surveyees recovered and rated NEC highly. You can try the supplement, but just know that it probably will not work. And exercise, it was mentioned two times. It was even more popular than NAC, so its chances of success are even lower. Also note that most people had very negative experiences with exercise, so it may actually cause more harm than good in most people. Natto kinase was mentioned three times. This is a natural enzyme that's made from fermented natto. Uh, Ixbot is hyperbaric oxygen therapy. It was mentioned three times. It's FDA approved for various conditions such as wound healing. Uh, the people who like this use higher pressure hard shell Ixbot, which is a lot more expensive. So this is the most proven treatment for long COVID right now, and its use is supported by data from a well-designed randomized controlled trial from Israel. This should be the go-to treatment for long COVID, but unfortunately, a lot of people just don't even know about it. And finally, we have four responses for time helped and five people who either didn't respond to the question or said that no treatment helped. This strongly suggests that there are few people who simply just get better over time, just doing nothing. So if you simply do nothing and don't take risk with unproven treatments, the data indicates that you have a small chance of getting better. So overall, the big picture that emerges is that every person is different and takes a different path to recovery. There hasn't been any universal treatments that work for most people. Some people will react badly to the top treatments such as Ixbot. Most recovered people had negative or very negative experiences with intense exercise, which may cause more harm than good. Now, let's broaden our scope and look at the results from the first method. Here the data here, the data gets messier than my room, even if we only look at treatments where at least two people recovered. This, me this method gives a much longer list of treatments that's just all over the place. To understand why that is, let's first look at how people answered the survey. In the graph shown on screen, I plotted the number of treatments rated as significant improvement versus the other answers. In the top left area of the graph, you can see the everything works people. They said that most of the treatments that they tried led to significant improvement. So that's just how they see the world. What's probably happening is that some of these treatments did not lead to improvement. Those responses are injecting erroneous data into the overall results. You could think of it as no noise in the data that you should ignore even if um, they're on the treatment list from earlier. So to help you understand the difference between random noise and what's showing up in the data, I plotted the actual data versus randomly generated data. So if everyone answered randomly, then it'll look like the red line. The actual data is shown in the blue line. So where the blue line is a lot higher than the red line, the data is suggestive of an effective treatment. So either the treatment does something, or there's a bias in the data in how people answer the survey, causing them to like those particular treatments. So for example, people may be heavily biased towards prayer because they think highly of their religion or just prayer itself. However, not a single recovered person said that prayer helped them the most. So that's why you have to take the data with a grain of salt because some of the treatments may not actually do anything medically. Um, so ideally, you know, we'd have like randomized controlled trials so that we have like super reliable data as to whether or not a particular treatment works. But, you know, we, we, make, the, we make do with what, what we have right, right now. So let's look at the treatments with a stronger signal for efficacy. So stem cells, only four people tried this intervention. Two people recovered and rated it highly. I, I don't know too much about this modality, unfortunately. So this treatment is expensive and I don't want, to I don't want people to be disappointed that they discover that there's little to celebrate about this treatment. And next treatment, cat's claw. This is a vine plant with like hooks that look like a cat's claw. It's, it's not an animal product, it's totally vegan. So it's been used in traditional medicine for a long time. You can buy extracts from this plant as a supplement. 
the two people who rated this highly also rated most treatments highly so this could you know be a false signal and next drug uh, cochicine it was originally produced from the autumn crocus plant uh, but nobody does it that way anymore so nowadays it's a prescription drug um, maybe it helps maybe it doesn't uh, serapeptase and lumbro kinase. So serapeptase is often used in combination with lumbrokinase, so it's possible that the combination of both at the same time uh, makes a difference. Both are supplements, so they're really easy to get. Um, be very very careful about these supplements uh, making you bleed too much, because that's something that could happen. And then the, the next thing on the list, uh, the eye drug is something that showed up on this survey and the last survey. I posted information on this drug, both good and bad, at the sick and abandoned forum uh, where YouTube can't censor information. So just go there for more information. Uh, the link is in the video description below. And then statins, this is a prescription drug that lowers cholesterol. You can buy it as a supplement, but it's still the same molecule as the prescription drug Lovastatin. LDN is low dose naltrexone, a prescription drug, but dose that's at much lower than normal amounts. And then corticosteroids. So this is a prescription drug that suppresses your immune system. On the last survey, this drug was very popular, but nobody recovered on them. So I wasn't expecting it to show up here in a big way. There were many people who um, report very negative experiences with drug. So be, so be careful. It's often used for a short period of time only. Um, and then like when you stop, the symptoms re return. And if you use these long term, they, they cause problems like related to long term use. So what, what I should have done is to ask about long-term corticosteroids, as that would have been more relevant to recovery. But for now, um, just take this data with grain salt because this drug is risky, may cause harm, and may not even lead to recovery. And then low histamine diet, uh, like corticosteroids, this didn't show up as a successful treatment in the last survey. However, it looks pretty safe because 200 people on the current survey tried this, and not a single person reported a negative experience from the diet. It does seem to lead to symptom relief, so it can definitely be worth trying. And that covers the top treatments from this list. So at this point, I know that I've thrown a lot of information out there. And the honest truth is that some of the information is conflicting or unreliable. So that's just a reflection of the real world, which is messy and full of people who just haven't healed from chronic illness, unfortunately. So th this problem is really hard to solve. And I'm not going to manipulate the data so that I can tell you what you want to hear. That's not real science, and it would be a huge disservice to people just trying to heal. Uh, for a deep dive into reliability issues with survey data, see the video description below, go to the slide deck, and read the appendices. However, I'm still allowed to speculate. So here are some ideas as to why most people aren't recovering and what they're doing wrong. So number one, treatments seem to be double-edged swords. They help some people and hurt others. So for example, Ichbot is one of the riskier treatments out there, and some patients are reporting long-lasting worsening from Ichbot. Some patients are probably hurting the recovery by committing to treatments that make their symptoms worse in the long run. So the current evidence leans towards discontinuing treatment early if your symptoms are going the wrong way. This isn't popular, and not a lot of people are doing this, but it could actually be a big reason why so few people are recovering. And another way to lower risk is just to start with low dosages before going higher. And then number two, it seems that people may need multiple treatments to just push them over the edge into the recovery zone. So that was my experience anyways. So without multiple successes, people don't end up in the recovery category and their successful treatments don't get noticed as much. Number three, the survey generated data on how popular treatments are. And it turns out that most people aren't trying the best treatments. So only 4.8% 4 tried high-pressure HBOT, even though it's the most proven treatment for long COVID. 15 out of 23 people, or roughly two-thirds, uh, tried IV ozone, but didn't try any form of HBOT. So those people could have just spent their money on HBOT first, and it would have been a much better idea. So keep in mind that people like me recover without knowing any of this stuff. I got my life back despite my ignorance. So to recap, here are the key points about treating chronic illness. These are the most promising treatments according to survey data or randomized controlled trial data. Uh, Ichbot, fasting, 
uh, certain supplements, natokinase, serapeptase, maybe casclot, maybe NEC, and certain prescription drugs like stromecto, statins, maybe colchicine, maybe LDN. I've excluded treatments that I don't know much about or treatments where there's a real potential for more harm than good. Uh, in the future, we'll have more data on whether or not I should have uh, included those treatments in this list. So let's just circle back to HBOT and fasting. So if you don't know much about HBOT or fasting, there are primers on those treatments. Links are in the video description below. And with HBOT, you should avoid uh, buying too many sessions at once in the beginning in case you're one of those people who react badly to it. So as far as the supplements go, I've compiled a shopping list to make it easy for you to figure out what to buy and how to save a little money. And then you just can you just go ahead and buy everything from iHerb.com, Amazon, or your favorite supplement retailer. So while iHerb and Amazon have affiliate programs, I didn't sign up for them, so I'm not tainted by any conflict of in, conflicts of interest. For the prescription drugs, things get more complicated, and I don't want to like risk oversimplifying things. So just head on over to the Long Haul Wiki channel on odyssey.com where I put up more information like how to find doctors to prescribe drugs for you, possible mechanisms of action, etc. The protocol video there will have a list of some relevant prescription drugs, but you'll need to put in some work to figure out how to get access to those prescription drugs. The normal way is just to find a doctor that will work with you. Uh, if you need help figuring things out, if you have any questions, or if you just want to connect with other people with chronic illness, feel free to post away at forum.sickandabandoned.com. And finishing off the key points about treating chronic illness, the current data leans towards taking a conservative, risk-averse approach to treatment. So number one, discontinue treatment early if it's going the wrong way. And number two, start with low dosages before going higher. The data for this is far from definitive, but as the saying goes, better safe than sorry. And there you have it, folks. That's the latest data on treating chronic illness. We haven't found a miracle cure yet, but at the same time, people have recovered, and I've just shown you the data on what they said helped. And finally, there's one last thing to talk about. So far, I've done all of this research on my own dime so that there are no conflicts of interest that would prevent me from putting out honest, independent information. But there's a downside. Because I don't solicit donations, I don't have the resources to spread this information far and wide. So I need your help. So just please click the like and subscribe buttons and the recommendation algorithm will push the information out there to just more people. Just two simple clicks can help somebody out there find answers for their suffering. Thank you, and I hope that all chronic illness sufferers out there will wave goodbye to the brain frog one day. Bye.